Welcome everyone. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. I see the attendee number climbing. We're all coming into our Zoom room here. So I'm just gonna give one moment. I'm sure we're finishing up dinner. Maybe we're grabbing a drink. I want to give everybody a chance to get their computers warmed up for just a second. Well, welcome, 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 and good evening. I'm so excited for everyone who is joining us here in Zoom as well as on Facebook and all of our other social media channels tonight. I am joined tonight by Theta Sandiford, who is going to be leading our very first in a series of virtual tours that we're calling Inside Look. And these are virtual tours of our newest exhibition that opened just about a week ago, the 2021 New Jersey Arts Annual Revision and Respond. And we're very excited to be able to welcome Theda here. She's going to give us her perspective on this exhibition by really looking more closely at a few works in the show, including her own. So we're gonna get a lot of wonderful insight. This show is now on view at the museum. Um, we are so excited to be reopened and to have this as our first exhibition. We're gonna put some information below right now that you can click on if you wanna learn more about the 2021 New Jersey Arts Annual. And we're very excited to be hosting it this summer. So before we begin this look at the exhibition, I wanna introduce Theda Sandiford, who is an award-winning self-taught fiber and installation artist based in Jersey City, New Jersey. Theta's first professional creative endeavors were in the music business as a marketing executive. After years of groundbreaking digital work, she began to explore her own artistic self-expression through art therapy. Utilizing 100 foot extensions of rope, twine and yarn, impeccably wrapped, woven, tied and embellished with recycled beads, ribbon, lace, tape and bottle cap baubles, Theta lures you into her imbued, enmeshed installation symbolizing natural hair, which you're gonna, you're gonna see some of these in just a moment. Theta's bold, whimsically twisted and locked forms gingerly invite the audience into off the wall conversations about microaggressions against black women and their hair. And um, I just wanna highlight here as well that Community art making is key to her process. Theta curates multidisciplinary experiences. She pairs people, music, art making, and creates a safe, sp safe space to explore themes such as equity, inclusion, sustainability, and personal well being. And you may not know this, but Theta has shown extensively nationwide. So, just to name a few here, she's been included in Spring Break Art Show, BWAC Wide Open. New Jersey Arts Annual and American Contemporary Craft, the National Juried Exhibition. Um, and she's received excellence in fibers from Fiber Art Now, the 2020 New Jersey Arts Visual Artist Award, and the 2021 Fellowship in Craft from the New Jersey State Council of the Arts. Incredible. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Theda. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. And, and you reading my intro, I feel like, wow, did I do all that? <laughs> Incredible work, incredible and well, well deserved. I'm excited to be with you tonight and you have prepared such an incredible tour for everyone. I know you and I have chatted about it previously. And before we dive right into that, um, you and I kind of wanted to show all of our viewers just a little sneak peek into the exhibition because some people may not know this and I might mention it, you know, three to four times tonight, but we are reopened to the public. So we're just going to do a quick lap around the exhibition. This is the gallery space here. And you can see a little taste of what is on view. And we've put in, in the comments below and in the chat a link there. If you'd like to go ahead and book a timed ticket to visit the exhibition, please do. We are booking timed tickets to just keep everyone safe. 
I've done a couple of these virtual um, uh, walkthroughs and this one really, I've actually been to the exhibit I went last weekend and this was really, really good. But I would urge everyone to actually go to the museum at, to see the works. Um, for me, it was super exciting to see the works in person, seeing them, seeing them virtual, you get a sense, but it's not nearly as good as seeing it in person. Thank you for that, Theda. Yes, and I, I definitely agree with you. There were many works that on working on this show just read so differently through a photograph, yours included, yours included. There's so many details I caught when seeing it in person that I, I just couldn't see in a photo. So I'm stopping here just at a few works that I want to make sure everyone makes note of as we go through our tour tonight. Some important ones here. I'm going to back up just a smidge. There we go. I'm trying to go slowly. I don't want to make anyone feel vertigo or anything. Hello, old friend. And our last stop here. I'll just show you all one last look here at the whole show. These incredible artists. All right, so I'm going to leave everyone wanting more, right, Theda? We want to. Yeah, just... you guys got to just book the ticket and go see the show. Exactly. We'll just give a taste. And I'm going to turn it over to you now. I, I want to, again, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I'm very excited to hand the reins over to you. I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity to talk about the works. Um, my work is centered in social justice and I picked a number of pieces that I think are centered in, in social justice as well. But what I found most interesting about uh, the conversation of social justice is the materials that were used. Um, so materiality for me is incredibly important. I think we all have a lifelong relationship with objects. And we assign meaning to objects that become part of our own narrative. Our possessions are extensions of ourselves. We use them to signal to ourselves the, and the narratives of others. They tell a story of who we want to be and where we want to belong. And after we're gone, they become our legacy. Some might even say our essence lives on in these stories, lives on in what we once made or owned. And our attachment to objects starts pretty young. I have a strong attachment to the very first teddy bear my dad gave me and this quilted dog that my grandmother gave me. This thing's over 50 years old. And it's no wonder why fiber continues to fascinate me to this very day, this being the, my very first pillow. Uh, through adolescence, possessions increasingly reflect who we are, or at least how we'd like to see ourselves and how we would like others to see ourselves. So if we could go to the next slide, we're going to take a look at Donna Basson's work. As our lives unfold, our things embody our sense of identity even further. What we wear, how we wear it, what we collect, what we discard. These become, things become external receptacles for our memories, our relationships, and our travels. And the events of 2020 are now part of the fiber of our very being. We have collected things and made masks. I got an incredible mask collection now. Hoarded toilet paper, retreated inside only to rediscover our possessions anew. The artists in the Revision Respond exhibition have all done this to that. Captured and suspended a moment in time to create memory. Donna Basson's My Own Witness, Rapture and Repair Messiah. This piece is a digital photograph that is woven with gold rice paper and thread. Donna Basson is a trauma therapist by day. She witnesses the stories of her patients and has done the same with this photo series, collecting and preserving the memories of her community. And she started this in 2016 after the presidential election. She collaborated with individuals who felt invisible and unentitled as Americans. Her subjects told her stories through prose, 
gesture, props, asserting their identity and their humanity. Donna rips her photos to express the damage rendered by the fear of other. This is inspired by the Japanese practice of kintsugi, which repairs broken pottery while highlighting its scars. She restores the torn photographs and portraits that she takes with golden rice paper and thread, underscoring the need to mend our wounds. Though, fiber, though Donna uses fiber in her work, she told me she's not a fiber artist. She asserts that the only class that she had a hard time in school in was home ec. And I don't really believe her, but she says her bad sewing works well here because it's both raw and beautiful at the same time. Well, that I do agree. The thread is a symbol of the internal injuries of her subjects. These wounds are healed by thread and are inspiration to move forward, giving voice and visibility to move the bystander to become an active witness. Next slide. Um, this is my piece. You are so articulate. Our brains attach the memories of events uh, that transpired last year, for me for, in particular. Um, Black Lives Matter social justice protests, viral videos of Karens weaponizing their privilege, violence against Asians, even this year, or three, starting at the beginning of the pandemic, the ritualistic chanting of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd. Our collective memories are attached to whatever objects are centered around these events. Um, also the videos that capture, capture the injustice that is part of the daily life of someone who's a person of color. Protest signs, masks, gloves, uh, COVID obituaries, infection rate statistics. These have become the signs of our times of the past year. And microaggressions even, prevalent in everyday interactions that communicate negative assumptions towards me as a member of a marginalized group. In this particular weaving, each piece of yarn is representative of a conversation that I had last year where I was acknowledged for being able to express my thoughts and ideas. And being told you're well-spoken may seem like a compliment, but it really is a backhanded compliment. One that carries the connotation that it is unusual for someone of my race to be intelligent or eloquent. It's even worse to be told, you speak white. Those conversations exist in every single weft and every single thread that I use. So if you look at the piece, literally every color, every piece of thread is that conversation each time I had it. So that's hundreds of conversations where that came up for me last year. People who, commun who commit microaggressions are often unaware that they're doing it. And if you point it out to them, they'll say, that's not my intention, you're being too sensitive, which is yet another microaggression. The weight of these daily interactions underpins real consequences for me, stress, frustration, self-doubt, powerlessness, and ultimately invisibility. This completed weaving is displayed on a DYI six foot by four foot loom as if the work is still in progress because some version of this conversation continues for me still to this very day. We'll go on to the next slide. All sorts of things have become signifiers for our identity, a reflection of who we are and what we stand for, or at least how we'd like to see ourselves and what we want for our lives and others and how we want others to see ourselves and the kind of world we wanna live in. Daniel Scott, is this all, all we are made of? Um, is made of acrylic paint, a panel board, bullet shell casings, a, a spatula, and a drain to, to pull this together. She creates bold, thought-provoking works based on her life experience. And is this what we're all made of? Conveys beauty and pain that she absorbs from the world around her. She uses photo montage, these found objects and raw materials, resin and collages all these elements together. She aims to entice the viewer 
to transport them away from pretentiousness and into a realm of truth. The bullet casings in this piece came from shooting ranges throughout New Jersey. And some came from her frequent hikes upstate New York, where her son goes to school. The gunshots, some of the gunshot shells also came from another artist in Connecticut. Danielle is like me in that she sources her materials from a variety of places and people share things with her all the time. She told me she wants the viewer to understand the depths of what's going on in today's society. Is this what we're all made of? Come from a series called Heavy and Loaded. And the piece represents all the black and brown children who are innocently killed just for being a child of color. Children of color walk around feeling like they have targets on their backs because of their skin tone. And when creating this piece, she thought of Emmett Till, Tamara Rice, her four-year-old son, Noah, and her 19-year-old son, Jacob, the one who goes to school upstate. Creating work like this is not easy. It's very, very emotional. And she feels it's her duty as an artist and as a mother to highlight these stories through her artwork. Um, next piece, Joan Diamond, uh, The Enduring. This is made with plastic bags, quilt fabrics, netting, and silk organza. Um, Objects are not only special in their ability to recall memories, but because of the attachment to a person that might be associated with it. Object materiality often secretes more meaning than was consciously inscribed in them, making them into archives that trigger storytelling and disrupt narratives. All the pieces in the show do just that. Materiality has an active role to play in the creation of memory triggering and reshaping our recollections, all while linking people across generations. Joan Diamond asks, what are we mindful of and what do we hold dear? Um, the momentary utility of plastic bags, which can take 500 years or more to degrade, and the love of quilts are combined here to question our perspective about what we hold dear, what is precious. When we think about um, uh, economics uh, and how economics has driven the use of plastics as a cheap, readily available material, and that has now become a threat to our environment. And if you're old enough to remember, you could consider the irony that our consumptive society transitioned from paper bags to plastic bags as a means to save the trees. When I was a kid, that, that was how use plastic, it will save the trees. It's so completely ironic now that we have plastic littering everywhere. Joan is committed to environmental justice, which is to me a social justice issue and is one of the reasons why I chose to include this work as part of this talk. Environmental justice aims to improve and maintain a healthy environment for those who have traditionally lived and worked closest to, uh, lived and worked closest to sources of pollution. Historically, these are marginalized communities. Um, the attachment to environmental issues runs strong in Joan's family. Her sons go to a nature camp. They go hiking, canoeing, they got forest skills. These are at the forefront of the gener of the things that these young men are interested in. Her husband is an environmental lawyer specializing in Superfund sites. And the talk around her family dinner table centers on issues affecting layer, land, air, and water. For this piece, Enduring, she placed bids on eBay for cutters quilts and if you don't know, cutters quilts are worn bits of quilts, some of which are, the segments have literally been kept out. The owner might keep a part of the quilt that they like best and get rid of the rest of it. And she sourced the single use plastic bags that are used in the quilt that she's made here through a community Facebook group. This artwork is made using uh, a technique called bahogi. Um, bahogi is a traditional sewing technique performed by women through the generations where they mend small bits of cloth to make what is called the wrapping cloth. Uh, small cloth swatches that are around 18 to 25 inches, um, not large like a quilt that you would put on the bed. 
These wrapping cloths are meant to use, uh, be used on auspicious occasions and to contain something uh, precious. You would take a wrapping cloth, you would wrap a gift in it. So Joan borrowed the concept of bahogi and the idea of using basic and discarded materials as a vehicle to house things that are precious, big ideas that are precious, asking the viewer to contemplate, are we mindful enough for what we hold dear? Joan hopes this work helps viewers redefine their sense of what is precious. Next slide. As the years go by and we get older, we hold on to our beloved objects and our photographs and now digital journals that document the best moments of our life on Instagram, YouTube, or TikTok. These things embody our memories. If you think for a moment about your own objects and focus on what may seem as unusable, something, some sort of item that might be regarded as garbage, like a plastic bag, an old t-shirt, or even an old quilt. Each of these items has a story to tell. To hold on to your connection to the object, I suggest creating something new, something that retains its sentimental value or even changes the narrative. This work documents your story, stories that will make you laugh, cry, and remind you of moments in your own life. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to take down the PowerPoint for just one moment because I wanted to give a little time for any questions, if, if that's okay with you, Theta. Of course, because I went a little faster than I thought I would. That's okay. It was excellent. There are questions. It was excellent. Yes. I, if I know our viewers, like I hope I do, they're probably typing frantically. So we'll give them a few moments because I know typing out a question can take a little longer than, than speaking one, you know, in person, but thank you so much for looking at those works. And um, wow, you I, gave I, me a whole new lens to view these through. Uh, you know, one of the things that I thought was so excited about the show is particularly when I went to go see the show in person was seeing all the materials um, that uh, the artist chose to use. And the assignment was pick three works. And it was really hard to pick three works. And I picked three that really kind of spoke to me from a social, social justice point of view. But as I was walking through the show and looking at the choice of materials, I was really blown away. I got a lot of ideas and I, I, it was really exciting to see some of the other weavings that were in there. Um, some of the other fiber pieces. Um, and, you know, sometimes photos just don't do things justice. So again, I want to encourage everyone to go to the show because um, you will see things in the works that just uh, seeing on a, 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 in a flat 2D image, you're just not really, you really can't see all of it. And I, as I was walking around the show I was, and taking pictures, I was like, hmm, I, if I had the opportunity, I would add these six other pieces in <laughs> to my talk. Uh, Antoinette asking how I source my materials. Uh, similar to Joan, I do post on social media when I'm looking for things. Um, uh, so if I'm, as I, for instance, I'm working with shopping carts right now, you'll see one behind me, uh, early, literally this week, I acquired three new shopping carts just from people see, seeing them, taking pictures and texting me, uh, the photo of the shopping cart and the address of where the, the, the shopping carts were. And when I do my morning walk, I go out and I go and grab them from these places. Um, I also will uh, uh, do, you know, do like an open call. Um, I'll post the materials I use as I do my process videos online. And when I do that, um, people will uh, inadvertently just send me things. Um, there are quite a few um, items that uh, show up for me all the time. There are a number of schools in Jersey City. Uh, there are a number of mom groups in Jersey City. Um, there are a number of individuals that they uh, they dumpster dive for me. And uh, I live in a doorman building and I, I get a call at least once a week. There's somebody down here with some garbage. I mean, art supplies for you. So um, <laughs> um, I get garbage bags uh, of random things dropped off for me all the time. And it's like Christmas for me. I just go through all that stuff, put on my gloves and I and I dive in. Um, and also, I just pick up things off the street all the time. 
Yeah, most of the materials actually in this piece, uh, all the ribbon that you see in this piece was donated to me. There was a Notion store in South Orange that went out of business and someone knew someone who then said, if you can get over here in an hour, you can get all, we'll give you all this ribbon. So I just hopped in an Uber and just cruised over there and, and picked up pretty much literally all that ribbon. Uh, I did buy uh, the paracord, but the majority of the materials are, I use are recycled. That's incredible. And we do have a question in the Q&A about this, uh, about your work, which is why I pulled it up. I, I know if everyone's like me, they're pretty visual. So I thought we could reference back to it. Um, and they asked, with your piece, the scale for them wasn't apparent in the photo. So how much does scale factor into your work? The handmade loom is also thoughtfully constructed and has some apparent meaning, how it hangs with the black hardware. Are there any extra thoughts you can share about that? Well, it is uh, six feet by four feet. Um, I wanted to work large because I knew the conversation was a big conversation. Um, I literally have someone telling me some version of your artic so articulate every single day. Um, so I knew that it couldn't be a small piece. Um, I, I knew it needed to be a large piece and there were, a couple of occasions, we'll notice that the there is a couple of pieces of yarn that are hanging out that are not completely woven in. I did that purposely because uh, I had finished the piece and I had curated a show about microaggressions and, and literally in the speech, someone said to me, wow, you articulated that so well. And I was like, oh my God, you just missed a whole point of what I just spent an hour talking about. And so af after the piece was finished, I went back in and wove that conversation into the piece and decided to leave the string out because clearly it's not a conversation that's going away anytime soon. I do like to work large. Uh, I think when things are small, you have to get up really close to it. Um, and you don't always have that opportunity. When something's really big, it hits you over the head. And if I want someone to be, you know, if it's about how I feel invisible um, by, in the face of uh, microaggressions, I wanted the piece to be very large to really express how big a conversation this is for me and how much I have to deal with it in my daily life. So I'm five feet, 11 inches. This piece is taller than I am. And it's obviously bigger than I am because I wanted to show that it's bigger than, the whole conversation is bigger than me. Thank you so much for sharing that. If you have any other questions for Theta, please put them in the Q&A or type them in the chat. Give you just a couple more. How much of your pieces evolve from the different vision and it deviate as you work? Um, I'm, I'm an intuitive artist. I, I, and I don't really sketch. I dream. I have a journal. I, I, I take my feelings because my practice is really rooted in art therapy, my own personal art therapy. I'm journaling my feelings. Um, and when I, I'm an insomniac and when I do fall asleep, I, I dream, I dream my feelings through art, if that makes any sense. So I can see where it starts and where it's going. What happens on that journey serendipity. It might be um, uh, one of those garbage bags of materials lands in my lobby and it has some materials I didn't even know I was looking for. That changes the direction of the piece. That happens frequently. Or I run out of a particular material and might have to improvise. Um, I've thought about if I want a very specific outcome, how I need to prepare my materials in advance. So I might take months just sourcing materials. For this particular work, I worked on it for four months. Um, I, every time I knew I wanted, kept having this conversation over and over and over again. And so I kept 
cutting the yarn and the rope and the ribbon that I was using and how much that conversation had an impact on me. And I kind of ran my fingers through it. And then I knew that this was the length and I just cut it and I stuck it in a bag. So when I actually sat down and started the process of weaving, conversations that I had already had and the memories of those conversations were attached to those ropes and in those yarns. And when I started the weaving process, it was as if the conversation came back to me. Um, so I'm taking a lot of time to prepare the materials so that I can see the vision through because when I dream it, I see I see where I'm starting and I see what it looks like in the end. Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll sketch it out if it's something that, if I'm not kind of like, did I see that? Did I remember that? But I often go back and refer to my journals, um, just my written journals, um, because again, it's tied to the emotions that I'm feeling. And that usually triggers the memory of what the visual piece that I wanted to create with it. Um, so it starts with the story, it starts with an emotion, and then I start sourcing the materials. Incredible. Thank you, Athena. I was thinking I might pull up just one more look at your work in the gallery, because I do think you can get a little bit closer, yeah, I, You a little richer as far as the textures go. I know we both just spoke about how images don't always convey. Yeah. I like to use materials to draw you in and make you want to touch, right? Um, and when I was in the gallery over the weekend, there was one little piece that I kind of wanted to adjust, but you know, the docents were in there and I was like, yeah, they don't know I'm the artist. I, I'm not supposed to touch it. But um, most of my works have that tactile quality to draw people in. And, you know, depending on where it's being shown um, in a white box gallery environment, you're not supposed to touch, there's rules. But um, that's why some of my works like the shopping carts I have outside because, they are tactile, they are meant to draw you in and they are meant to be touched. So yeah, if you can see um, the, there is uh, just, you know, a straight weaving and there's, there's an, a, a number of different uh, weaving techniques in here. Again, all, all of those choices were made based on the particular conversation and how it made me feel. And the more tortured it is, like if you see towards the top, those were conversations where I was definitely having a lot of angst. Um, you'll see some very tight weaving. That's me being anal retentive about it. And you'll see some loose, uh, some looseness around it. There's some humor that's in the work as well. So every single piece here is again, represented of an individual conversation and how it made me feel. Can you speak to color? I, I think for me, when I saw this piece, just very first time in person, the color palette really struck me. And I think to me also it's, I, I can't urge you enough to go see this in person because I think the colors play so differently in that lighting, but does the color palette come into play? Is it, is there significance? Is it what you're feeling, what you like? Well, I was really thinking about camouflage and hiding in plain sight. Um, so I chose, I, I made this, I wanted this to be like to be camouflage um, and the way in which, you know, you wear camouflage to blend in. Um, in this instance, I'm using camouflage to stand out. Um, uh, so in a way, you know, uh, the, when I'm dealing with the microaggressions over and over again, I ultimately feel invisible, like I'm not really there. And camouflage is a way to hide in plain sight. Um, and so I chose specifically colors to sort of make my own version of camouflage. Thank you for sharing that. It's incredible. And those, of course, there's things that are glittery in there too, because I've never met something glittery that I didn't like. <laughs> As you go to the, at the very top, you'll see some of the glitter. Yes, right in you here. See it, yeah, you see it in the in the in those black ropes. It's like a a, a braided three ply braided uh, uh, glitter glitter rope, and you can see uh, there's a tassel that's hanging off that's nice and glittery. I'm like, if it's glittery and shiny, I'm all about it. I, I think. Really, 
I, I when I when I was started working on this loom, if you look down at the bottom of it, you'll see that I kept some of the I kept some of the nails and I really just wanted it to leave it rough. And I, I really was, do I take this off the loom? Do I hang it? I even I even had um, a custom um, a steel rod made so that it could hang from uh, from the ceiling. But ultimately I was like, no, if this is if this is about microaggressions, this work in progress, I'm gonna leave it on the loom. Antoinette likes glitter too. Yes, I, I, I see that in the chat there. That makes so much more sense now when you when you mention, you know, to me, I think because of how striking the fibers are, the weaving is to me, I almost, the loom almost to me fades into the background a little bit. But now that you you explain that, it makes so much sense that it's, it is still in progress. Ma Maria Ross says glitter is forever. Yeah, Maria Ross has been to my studio uh, for a uh, holiday card making, and she's not allowed to touch the glitter anymore because I, oh. I, I, I'm still cleaning up glitter. And that was from two years ago. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> it gets everywhere, but it's just, you know, it's everything. <laughs> you guys have any more questions or about any of the other works in the show? I know one I'm very curious about is what you're working on now. And I know you mentioned it a little bit with the shopping carts, but I think everyone is probably dying to know what your upcoming projects are. I am definitely working on a series about emotional baggage um, and emotional baggage related to racial trauma. Um, and it, it, that I'm putting in a series of shopping carts. Um, they are very tactile. They're meant to be touched. Uh, you can move them around. I got one of them behind me. That's a work in progress right now. Um, I have three of the, my shopping carts in Summit, New Jersey uh, in their public square. So those are installed there. And I have one shopping cart out in Governor's Island right now at the Mokata house. So you can go out and interact with the shopping carts. They light up at night. You can touch them. You can move them around. They're meant to be touched. And when you do touch them and you see the tactile nature of them and you kind of get in, in sort of involved in the work, you're invited to think about your own emotional baggage, put it in the cart and push the cart away from you. So it's meant to be an emotional release of any sort of emotional baggage that you might be carrying. And if you're sitting here thinking, no, 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 I'm good. Uh, you're lying and uh, you know, everybody's got something. You might have a huge shopping cart or you might have like a little tiny shopping cart worth of uh, uh, baggage. And there's a lot of conversation relating to shopping carts. Cause if we think about, um, you know, uh, we can think about homelessness, we can think about um, being displaced. We can think about commercialism. We can think about um, how, how much and how we buy things have changed is specific particularly because of the pandemic. Um, I mean, I had not been to an actual supermarket um, in over a year. Things are just delivered to me now. So, so much has, uh, so much is uh, emotion and meaning is attached to shopping carts. And if you happen to see gold shopping carts around Jersey City, you can know that um, those are shopping carts that homeless people saw me uh, spray painting um, at the back of my building and said, can I get some paint? So I just spray painted their cart, bring a little joy into their life. And they kept it moving. Um, I spray paint all my shopping carts gold and then use recycled materials to weave on them. And again, same process as the, uh, as the weaving that's here, but uh, it's really me addressing the things that are uh, the emotional baggage I've been carrying around. Some of which are stories and incidents and things that have happened to me from childhood that I may have not, I've gotten rid of, um, but you know, triggers happen and then you're right back there, um, you know, a five-year-old with kids, you know, putting gum in your hair, just dumb things that might've happened to me as a kid. Um, so I'm really excited about uh, the baggage cart series and I'm obsessed with them. And that is the one item that most people now are sourcing for me. So this week I got three new, three new shopping carts. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I'm looking for right now. 
I can't wait to see one of those out in the wild, as it were. <laughs> I cannot wait. Yes, those are in the wild. And yes, you can touch them. They're meant for touching. You've just made so many people happy. <laughs> We have one question in the Q&A here, and then I think we'll be coming up on our time together, unfortunately. But we have Anne who's asked, when you decided to leave the loom, did you consider its presence, the rawness of the wood, as a comment on the emotional confinement um, regarding the microaggressions? Oh, and you're so smart. You just knew. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of thoughts around, well, am I going to leave it on the loom? Should I paint this background? Should I, should I leave the markings that I did to like mark where I was going to put the nails? Um, should I clean it up a bit? Uh, I decided to leave it raw, um, because yeah, when I'm dealing when I'm dealing with the microaggressions, I, I feel like my layers have been peeled away. Um, and it's like a scab, um, you know, it's a scab that gets picked open and it bleeds again. It's very, it's raw. So I decided um, all the things that I thought I would do to pretty it up were not appropriate for the piece. Um, um, that I would leave it raw. I would, I would have it look somewhat unfinished um, and have those be a part of the finished work so that people would be wondering why is that there? And then when they got, you know, when they connect with the piece, they can, they can actually maybe get a sense of the emotions that went into making the work. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And thank you for that question. I'm going to pull up our PowerPoint just one more time because I do want to make sure everyone leaves this talk tonight with your information. They're absolutely going to go on and follow you if they don't already, which it sounds like uh, with Maria Ross, we do have some fans in the audience tonight, which I love to see. Um, so on this slide here, Theta has provided us with her Instagram at Miss Theta and her website, incredible website, definitely check that out. And we will put that in the chat as well for you all so you can click on that. I want to thank you so much, Theta, for spending tonight with us, for sharing your insights into your piece, but also into the other works in the show. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. And I encourage everyone, go out to Newark Museum. And if you want to go and do the show with me, just hit me up on Instagram and let me know when you're going and we'll make it work. I love that. Oh, I want to talk with you, Theta. Well, I want to say thank you one more time. I want to say thank you to everyone here on Zoom and on social media who's joining us for tonight's Inside Look. Remember, this is the first of three. So we have two more coming up. Mark your calendars for July and August, where we will hear from two more artists in the exhibition. We have artist Michelle Black joining us and artist Karen King Choi. So check out our website, please. Uh, make sure you sign up for that. Put that on your date book. Summer will get busy and I don't want you to miss out on these incredible um, tours of the show. Thank you so much for your support tonight. Um, if you did enjoy tonight's program, we ask you to consider making a donation to make these programs possible for us. And I also want to remind everyone that the 2021 New Jersey Arts Annual Revision and Respond is a project of the New Jersey State Council. So it is presented by them and we wanna thank them for their partnership in making this happen. What an incredible way to spend a Thursday night, Theta. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. And I wanna thank all the artists for their work. Um, it's amazing um, how, how diverse the work is in this show. And when you do walk around the show, it's almost as if it really was like a journal for what 2020 was for all of us. Very, um, very much emotional for me to, to walk through. And I think you touched on that, very emotional, very raw. Um, and because of that, we have created an activity within the space where we are asking visitors to give their emotional response to the works that they see. So put it on your date book this summer. Come see us at the New York Museum of Art. Come see these incredible artists and what they've created for us. Come check out our emotional response emoji activity. 
And maybe grab yourself a ticket to our Arts in the Garden series. We are doing programming in our garden this summer. We're keeping it safe and socially distanced. We have concerts, we have movie screenings, um, dances, performances, and much more. Ida, thank you so much for your time tonight. And you, incredible, Maria. incredible work. Um, congratulations on this um, exhibition. We're so excited to have you in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. And we will see you in the gallery.